Hello, my name is April Hewlett and I'm with the University of Idaho and today we're going to talk about state and transition models. From the previous lecture, you've started to understand what succession is, whether it's primary or secondary succession. We see changes in plant communities over time. When we think about rangelands and other ecosystems for that matter, sometimes there are problems with linear succession and we don't see these patterns occur. So I want you to think why there might be some problems with linear succession on rangelands. There's a lot of different reasons and we're gonna talk about some of them today. One of them is demographic inertia. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we might have non-climax competitive species that remain dominant no matter what kind of disturbance is removed. For example, if we have a cheatgrass monoculture or one species of cheatgrass, then a lot of times even when we remove disturbance, we don't see that successional progression start to occur. Another example of demographic inertia would be in a desert system where we have plant compositions that are really dynamic. If we have a really wet or dry year, for example, in the Mojave Desert, we might see a large flux of wildfires or, or wildflowers, or we might see no wildflowers if we're in drought conditions. So the plant composition's dynamic. One of the I mean, the Mojave Desert, obviously, if you saw pictures from this year, you saw that it was really in bloom. But this also occurs on any kind of ecosystems. When we have precipitation differences, we're going to have plant compositions that change. Another thing to consider when we look at linear succession is that sometimes we have loss of plant materials. For example, we might have overgrazing that occurs on a certain species, and because of that overgrazing, they might be eliminated. This can be used for our benefit or to the detriment of the ecosystem. For example, if we have a lot of weed species and we can use targeted grazing, then that's a great thing for our overall ecological health. Another thing is species might be outcompeted by other plants, or they could be lost in a drought. All of these things are going to influence the linear progression of succession. One of the things we're really seeing in the West is that we have this fire feedback loop. And essentially what that is is that grasses, such as cheatgrass, they increase the fire frequency because they can dry out earlier. They're that fine fuel that's easy to ignite. And when they do burn, the fire actually promotes more grasses Hence, we're in this cycle or this fire feedback loop where we have more grasses that promote fire and then the fire promotes more grasses and it just goes over and over. Similar to the fire feedback loop, we also have a soil feedback loop. And when we start to lose our seed bank, for example, in this area where we have a juniper and a woodland encroachment, you can see that we've lost our seed bank. We've lost that understory. And when we do that, we increase the amount of bare ground that we have. And when we increase the amount of bare ground we have, we're going to increase our erosion. And when we, erosion occurs, then we see that loss of the seed bank even more. We have loss of nutrients. We have more opportunities for compaction to occur. Again, all of which leads to more erosion. So you can see how it's just an, a, a feedback that goes on and on. And what this does to linear succession is prevents it from moving to that climax community. Here's an example of why we don't always see linear succession in rangelands or why we often don't see linear succession. Here are two different examples or two different community types that occupy the same habitat type. And that habitat type is Wyoming Big Sagebrush Blue Bunch Wheatgrass. The photo on the left is dominated by cheatgrass and bottlebrush squirrel tail, and the photo on the right is dominated by Wyoming big sagebrush and blue bunch. Both of these communities are relative, relatively stable. So when we think about linear succession, what's going on in these ecosystems? Well, there's a few things that you need to consider. One of the problems with successional models is that there's often multiple pathways of succession. It's not one linear path. Two, there's multiple stable vegetation types. Both of these communities are relatively stable how they are and are likely not going to change until some disturbance occurs. And there's no single and certain endpoint when we think about succession on rangelands.
One of the things that I would like you to remember when you think about managing rangelands is that oftentimes we can't equate that climax community with the range conditions on the land. So for example, we know that different sites have different potential to grow different vegetation. So don't get stuck in the idea that we have to get to a climax community. We can actually have really functioning rangelands with pioneer species, with intermediate species, as well as climax communities. What becomes key is that we see this mosaic or we see different vegetation characteristics across the landscape. So I mentioned site potential in that last example. And what do I mean when we say site potential? This is going to drive what kind of plant communities or what our functions are on a lot of rangelands. So when we talk about site potential, we're referring to precipitation. How much precipitation does this plant community receive? What is the temperature? Do we have um, a freeze-thaw cycle that might influence soils, for example? Soils become really important. Do we have rocky soils? How much water or uh, water holding capacity do they have? We can think about the topography, the elevation aspect. All those things play a role in what's uh, your site's potential. So look at these two maps. Here's just a basic map of the different ecosystems in Idaho. And next to it is the annual average annual precipitation map for Idaho. So you can see where we have coniferous forests, we see higher amounts of precipitation, right? When we see this sagebrush grassland, we're really down into the less than 16 inches of precipitation a year. So you can see how the annual precipitation really drives, in this example, these different types of rangelands that we have in Idaho. If linear succession doesn't really work to explain all of the ecosystem dynamics of rangelands, what do we have that provides some kind of framework so we can conceptualize what could happen in a different plant community? And that's where state and transition models come into play. State and transition models essentially do two different things. One, they describe vegetation dynamics, which we'll go into. So what in this stable state, for example, can your vegetation be? And two, how does that different, or how do those different vegetation types respond to either natural or management-induced disturbances? And when those disturbances or management practices occur, how is that going to shift our vegetation dynamics? So we'll go through some examples of state and transition models next. So let's go through an example of a state and transition model. So this is one in a sagebrush steppe ecosystem, and within this we have different steady states. And a steady state refers to um, a community that's suspended in succession unless something drastic is going to happen. So in this example we have four different steady states as indicated by those blue boxes. Within that steady state we might have various vegetation dynamics. So this is an example of that top steady state. So we could have sagebrush and late seral state communities. We can have native perennial grasses dominate. And then we can have different changes or, that happen across years. So within those stable states, we can have transitions. And transitions are just disturbances or competitions that cause that plant community to shift but still stay within that stable state. So we're still in that top box of the state and transition um, model. However, we can see that our vegetation dynamics change, and these change with different transition factors. So here's an example of a burn. So in 1979, we had pre-burn conditions. We were probably in a late seral stage or step community. And over time, we had a burn. And so first year after burn, you can see we shift to more of a perennial bunch grass situation. And then over time, again, following kind of that linear succession pathway, we have our sagebrush plants start to come back in, which are more of our climax community. And then once they build up and become dominant, we can have another pre-burn and we'll shift back to the um, perennial bunch grass. So this is an example of transition in that top box. So we're not saying that it never gets to a climax community or that there's no change. But what we're saying is that it's a pretty healthy community. And when transition does occur, because we know fire, for example, is a natural process, it can still function as a plant community and it's going to re remain stable. So here's just another example of that sagebrush steps um, stable state that we just talked about. So here you can see that we have different 
transition factors. We might have fire. Fire is going to transition something from an area where we might have shrubs back into a grassland. We can just have successional transitions, which are essentially just time. So over time, sagebrush might or often comes back into the grasslands. And you can also have management dynamics within that stable state. So here we can see that we have improper grazing. And when we have improper grazing, for example, in an open sagebrush community, we're going to start to see a loss of our perennial grasses and we're going to have an increase in sagebrush. So basically, it just gives us a framework or this um, steady state gives us a framework of what we can manage so that we can see these transitions but still understand what the function is and where we might need to make adjustments so we can keep it in the stable state. So in this example of the state and transition model, we have three different steady states. So we have state one, which we just talked about. We're going to see vegetation dynamics or changes in our vegetation. But we also can have different steady states. So here we have state two, which is cheatgrass or medusa head. This is considered a stable state because of that fire feedback loop that we just talked about. It can maintain itself through disturbances, just like we talked about in state one earlier. And then we have state three, which is the introduced grass pasture. This might be an example of when we go and plant crested wheatgrass. It's not native, but it's still its own stable state. So what happens when we go from one stable state to another stable state? This is what we call a threshold. And a threshold is a transition where resources are lost so that the community cannot go back to that previous state without significant resource input by humans. And you'll see all of these arrows are just one direction and they cross a threshold. So here's just a visual example. So in the top one, we have that sagebrush step steady state that we talked about earlier. We're gonna have dynamics changed by that red arrow. But when we change from that stable state or those plant functioning groups to an annual dominated state, we cross a threshold. And now the only way we can get back to sagebrush step state, if at all possible, is to invest a significant amount of resources to get back into that previous stable state. The arrow next to the annual grass dominated state again just represents that fire feedback loop. So it's stable. Once we get annual grass dominated states, thanks to fire, it remains really stable. So again, it's another stable state. Here's just one more example or visualization of when we might cross thresholds from one steady state to another steady state. And remember that thresholds are irreversible and sometimes unpredictable. Within each of these steady states, we can have different management practices. Like we saw earlier with the improper grazing, we can also do proper grazing that can shift that, um, that top stable state around to different plant communities. The same or similar things can happen with the annual grass dominated state, for example, we might be able to utilize grazing to reduce the likelihood of fire. And when we do that, we might be starting to move towards more of a healthy ecosystem. However, it's still, it's going to take a lot of human input in order to cross back over. Another way to think about state and transition models is to picture the ball and cup or ball and trough analogy. And that black ball in those um, different troughs represent different community stable states. And when you cross a threshold, you move the ball from one community to another condition. So you'd move from one to two, for example, in that lower trough and ball um, example. And you can see you can have some fluctuation or movement of that ball within that trough. However, getting from one plant community to another is going to require human input. Another way to look at transitions or to look at these thresholds that we cross and these differences between stable states is to think about stepwise degradation. And this is from Wisnet 1999. And I like this paper because I can really visualize how degradation can occur on a rangeland. And it makes sense to me of when you might want to go in and, and do some kind of management action to prevent thresholds from being crossed. So in the community states, these are represented by different groups in this example. So you can have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all community states, and they're defined by their functional integrity. So, for example, are they able to capture water? How do they capture energy? Um, how's the nutrient retention? All of those things on the bottom of that figure. 
one of my favorite parts about this is to really conceptualize when management should occur and what's going to be the most cost effective. So as we move down that stepwise degradation ladder, as you can see in this quote, the expenses of management practices also increase. So if we're managing a community that's in one or two and we want to keep it there, we need to be really conscious of that and make sure that we do the right management actions. When we transition from a one to two, we cross a threshold. And when we cross that threshold, remember that it's going to um, require a lot of human input to get back to the community. So here are some examples of when we might cross those thresholds. So the first one transitioning from one to two would be a biotic threshold. Biotic meaning living, and in order to get back into plant community one from two, we'd have to do some kind of vegetation manipulation. Maybe that's using an herbicide to remove, to remove certain kinds of weeds, or maybe that's using uh, targeted grazing to again reduce what we don't want and to increase what we do want. So it's, it's manipulating the vegetation. The next degradation is an abiotic threshold, an abiotic meaning lawn living, and this requires some kind of physical manipulation. So this might include something like bringing in topsoil after we've had a, a lot of erosion. So you can see that that compared to a vegetation manipulation often requires a lot more resources. So let's look at some examples of when we might cross an abiotic or a biotic threshold. And it's not really as cut and dry as we like to think it is, but it's definitely something that we have to consider. So when we're going from a sagebrush step steady state to an annual grass dominated stable state, would you say we're crossing a biotic or an abiotic threshold? So it depends, right? So when we start to maybe cross a biotic threshold, maybe we're starting to see annual grasses come into our site, but they're not dominated. This would be a great time to do some kind of vegetation manipulation to hopefully reduce them or at least hold them or hold cheatgrass at bay. But when we get to the annual grass dominated state, we probably have crossed an abiotic threshold. For example, we're probably not retaining water the same way that we would with a native plant community. We're definitely seeing increases in fires, you can see in a lot of examples throughout the West. So the input there is going to cost a lot more than if we would have treated the site at the very beginning when we started to see cheatgrass. So it's kind of that balance. We obviously have to accept that cheatgrass is everywhere, but what's the point where we can start to do some biotic manipulations to hopefully minimize the chance that it will cross that ultimate threshold, which changes the fire cycle in those communities. Here's another example of biotic and abiotic thresholds. So this comes out of the Western Juniper Field Guide, which is on the bottom there, and I'll put it in the resources if you want to look at it. It's one of my favorite field guides. But anyway, so this is looking at pinion juniper encroachment. So in the first one, we you can see that we're in phase one. And phase one means that you can, and you can see this, that there's juniper that are coming into the site but we still have a lot of perennials, we still have a lot of shrubs, um, so our system is functioning pretty well. We go to that middle photo, we're in phase two. So here you can see that pinion and juniper are starting to dominate even more, and they're starting to outcompete some of our understory vegetation. And then we get to phase three, where you can see that the understory is completely gone and the pinion and juniper are dominating. So here's a few examples of when we cross biotic thresholds. So for example, when we go from phase one to phase two, we're essentially crossing a biotic threshold. If we go into the site and we treat the pinion junipers in phase one, it's gonna cost less money than if we treat it at phase three, for example. The area where we've crossed an abiotic threshold could be between phase two and phase three. Here, we've crossed an abiotic threshold because we've lost that understory component, and we've lost a lot of our soil, or our topsoil, through erosion, or that erosion and soil feedback that we talked about earlier. So abiotic meaning non-living, but we've crossed that non-living threshold because we have now soil movement. So here's just an example of how we can have multiple thresholds or stepwise degradation across the landscape. Rangelands are obviously dynamic, and because we don't follow the linear succession pathway in most of our rangelands, 
we need a way to conceptualize what's happening. And that's where state and transition models come into play. They provide us with a framework so we can start to understand transitions and we can start to understand thresholds so we can better manage the landscape to meet our goals and objectives. 